Hello and welcome back to the Evil Clones Podcast. Uh, this is a topic that I have been looking to uh, discuss for a while now, and that is X-Men on television, mm-hmm. which is pertinent now because one... Yeah, um, we got some news. Yeah, we, we got, got some news. news. Um, Deadpool just came out to great acclaim and box office. Yay! We loved it. Uh, X-Men Apocalypse is coming out later this, uh, this summer, and there are also... Two X Men inspired TV shows that are getting, uh, that have been pitched, uh, to the networks. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know the details, um, about. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's still the, very, it's still the very. Rights between yeah. uh, Marvel and Fox over, over the TV rights to X Men. For, yeah. with, with film, it's, you know, Fox owns the film rights, but TV rights are uh, somewhat negotiable, I guess. Yeah. I'm it's... not sure what Marvel got for them. That Fox is allowed to do this, but uh, maybe we'll find out later on. Anyway, yeah. but, so uh, the, but, but, but as for those two shows, it's still very very early in the process. But we know that one of them is about is called Hellfire. It's about the yeah. Hellfire Club. Yeah, um, and the other is called Legion. It's about uh, one of the old X Men characters named Legion. Now, uh, more specifically, Hellfire, uh, from what we've heard, follows like some kind of secret agent who finds out there's a, the, the, there's this clandestine a group of mutants. Yeah, uh, like of high class means that are um, uh, doing shit, uh, Pre- like all around the world, I guess. Pretty much what we saw in X Men First Class, you know, with Moira discovering um, Kevin Bacon and his operation. Yeah, so like, um, I take that and imagine that Moira's the main character. Yeah, and just sort of go from there. Yeah, and turn that into a show. Yeah. So, uh, so I wonder if the secret agent comes to think of it. I mean, I wonder a lot of things because it is so early in the process. But I wonder like. Uh, is the secret agent going to be somebody that they made up, or is it going to be somebody from the comics? Is it yeah, going to be, is it, you know, is it going to be a redo of Moira, yeah. or what? I don't know. It was not Moira because they made Moira CIA for yeah, yeah. the movie. So yeah. there are tons of you know like human characters yeah. and allies from the comics, I guess I guess and somebody. some not so allies yeah. that they could utilize for this show. Yeah. Um. But anyway, uh, as for the other one, uh, Legion. Uh, Legion is a character who debuted in the pages of New Mutants in the early 80s, I believe. That's right. He is actually the son of Charles Xavier, and his deal is basically that he's got kind of uh, multiple personality stuff going on in his head, and like, each different personality exhibits different uh, mutant powers. Yeah. <laughs> so, hence, he's called Legion. So got yeah. the same Pretty sure multiple personality doesn't quite work that way, yeah, but, but whatever. Yeah, it's it, so, it, it, it's you know pop psychology goes great with comics. Yeah, so, so it's fine. But it doesn't really sound like an X Men show. It's just kind of taking this one X Men character and, and making a whole show giving around that own concept. Show. Like you could just make that show, and it doesn't have anything to do with X Men. You're just like, hey, like let's just make uh, you know an X Men show, but we'll call it Alphas. Yeah, <laughs> you know that kind of thing. That that, yeah, that, yeah. that makes absolutely as much sense to me. So it is curious that we're gonna take just like, uh, zero in on specific ideas in the X-Men universe and turn those into TV shows instead of just saying, well, why don't we just make an X-Men TV show? Yeah. Obviously, it's, you know, not quite tenable to do that yet with the movie series still in full swing, especially they're releasing three X-Men movies this year. You know, there, there's X-Men Apocalypse and there's the two solos with Deadpool that just came out and then Gambit, which comes out at the end of the year. Right. So we'll see how those shake out. But, uh, yeah, I can understand why it, 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 it still seems like a strange way to go about it. Uh, let's just exactly, yeah. let's just pick out ideas. Yeah. But we'll still it's still tied to X Men somehow. Again, it's too early to say if this will even tie into the movie universe like the way Agents of Shield ties into the MCU or anything. But I don't know. Yes, indeed. But, I'm but, 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 it, but it is interesting and uh, you know looking forward to watching these projects uh, develop. Yeah. I would like to learn more about why these two yeah. uh, projects were chosen. I I have a feeling that there were a lot of ideas that yeah. were thrown around. Yeah, there must have been. Yeah, you know, there with, you know, as many as huge as the X Men universe is, and with all the uh, powers and subplots and uh, character arts going around, there's plenty that you could just make individual shows yeah. out of without <laughs> having to uh, pay service to the larger universe. Yeah, did did they try and make? Did they suggest pitching a Star Jammers series? You know, yeah. did they? Uh, want to give you know Generation X another go? Yeah, or you know or whatever like, is the, like is X the, Factor investigations exactly their yeah. favorite of X fans to see on TV. Yeah, uh, so like you know what or Alpha Flight. 
Yeah, I mean, well, what shows did they turn down uh, yeah, before they, they, they settled on these? these? Two. Yeah. yeah, it just seems like very sort of obscure ideas to, to slap the X-Men brand onto. Yeah. Since, you know, the X-Men is known to be this superhero team book. Yeah. But these aren't superhero team concepts that are being... Um, that are being looked over by the network. Too. They're not even heroes. They're both. Yeah. I mean, Hellfire Club is, you know, the villain team, and then Legion is himself a, a villain. He's one of those, you know, um, uh, guys, but who, you know, is a villain because he's crazy and he's too difficult to control. He's, yeah, exactly. He, that kind of thing. Yeah. The other cool thing about Legion is that he inadvertently set off the Age of Apocalypse. Yeah. So yeah. he's got that uh, uh, on his resume. The idea was that he. Uh, somehow travel back in time on a quest to kill Magneto uh, in the past. To uh, try, to try and do his dad a solid. Yeah. Uh, and the, the X-Men tried to stop him, but he accidentally killed Xavier instead, which completely cornholed the whole timeline and led to the Age of Apocalypse. Yeah, well, yeah which was great. Yeah. Uh, which was one of the better things to come out of the 90s. Yes. Um, uh, but anyway, they fixed that. Uh, I I'm not really sure what happened to Legion in the meantime. I know that when they were sort of bringing the immunes back together a few years ago, like around um, uh, Necrotia, I think uh-huh. they brought uh, my Legion back in the fold. I can't remember if he had been dead before or how he died or whatever, but yeah, he's one of those characters who has some cool ideas, but the X Men universe at large never really knew where yeah. to place him. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe we'll see how a show handles that character yeah. without having to have the whole mm-hmm. main themes of the X-Men to play with yeah. uh, as the main plot. Yeah, and I hope somewhere along the way, like if these two shows actually do, apparently they've just ordered pilots for yeah. right now, right? If both of them get picked up, and I, don't, I have no idea if they will, it's too early. Yeah. Um, it would be nice if they tied together somewhere along the way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah if, if these are both set in some sort of you know, larger X Men universe. If they could find a way to tie them together, I don't know how exactly. Yeah. The Hellfire Club, you know, seek this kid out. Does he go? Does he do the time travel thing and meet the Hellfire Club in <laughs> yeah. the '60s? Because the Hellfire Club is going to be set in the '60s, just like they were in the movie. Um, yeah. So I mean, even though Agents of Shield, they you know, they, they open season two with a flashback to uh, Agent Carter, and I've done a couple of Agent Carter flashbacks since then, of uh, you know, showing her with the Howling Commandos doing stuff. And that ties into cases they're working on in the present day. So, yeah. so you know, the, the, that kind of thing is cool. Yes. <sighs> but, yeah, interesting um, news bulletin. So we'll see how that shakes out down the road. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, for a while, even before I did my um, classic X-Men reading Odyssey the last couple of years, I was uh, sort of fascinated by, okay, how would I do an X-Men show? Not like a spin-off or whatever, just like a straight-up thing. Yes. Uh, and eventually... And I actually went back and read the comics, which I highly recommend doing, because there's, there's yeah. like really no substitute for going back and seeing how these characters first appear. Yeah, yeah. At, at some point, I think, um, that's something I learned growing up uh, as a comic reader, that it doesn't matter how much, you know, how many Wikipedia things you read or, you know, uh, stuff you collect or read about these stories and these characters, actually going back and reading the stories themselves um, is irreplaceable. Yeah. It gives you a whole different spin, especially since there's like a lot of stuff that may have been like retconned or fleshed out along the way. But uh, when you see it how it was first formed, it's not quite the same as you might expect. Yeah, like um, I feel like there was a lot of times in the early '90s when we were first reading where yeah, I didn't immediately realize that oh, that was that character's first appearance. Yeah, <laughs> that I read, and I like I knew him from the trading cards, but like I don't know. Cyber, for example. They yeah. Do with metal arms. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, yes. Metal arms were very in at the time. Yeah. When he showed up on in uh, in the pages of X Factor, I was like, oh, that's that's the first time we're seeing him. Like, but I like, looked on the back of the card. It's like, but yeah, I read that issue. I remember when he appeared. Yeah. So one thing I discovered: you go back and read like the very old X Men comics with the original five. That's Cyclops, Marvel Girl. Iceman, Beast, and Angel. Like the whitest kids in the world. Yeah, exactly. To start off. <laughs> uh, most adaptations and retellings don't start with that roster. I found out that the reason is that those five get stale really fast. Yeah. Because <laughs> like, even when they brought them back together for X Factor, 
Um, it was cool, like, getting the old band back together, and even, you know, they had gone through some shit, and now they're, like, grown up. But even then, after a while, it's like, please bring in the new team. Please bring in the random reject pilot that they brought together into an awesome team that then called them X Factor. That's so much cooler than what yeah. these five have become. <laughs> he went like Archangel going around and yeah, and, 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 and you know Beast was you know blue and furry by that yeah, point. Yeah, he didn't and, start uh, off that way. And, and yeah, 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 Scott yeah. and Jean had their marital or uh, with their relationship problems. Their, their epic, you know. Uh, co- you know, uh, cosmic rearranging marital issues of, you know, the Phoenix and the Dark Phoenix and Madeline exactly. Pryor and Even so on. Even with all of that, it had gotten stale and I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah so. but also, like, uh, uh, tied to that is reading them and seeing how the how the writing kind of switches and, you know, elevates. Like, you start off, you know, with the original team for a few years and then they kind of... Uh, effectively reboot the whole thing with giant size X Men, yes. and they start bringing in the international cast, and that's when things really kick into gear. Exactly. The writing yes. improves, the art, the art improves. Yes, the, it the, is the an Olympian improves. leap in quality in all areas when we bring in a uh, Chris Claremont to write, and he throws in Wolverine, and Storm, and Colossus, and Nightcore, and all the favorites, and we just get lots of classic stories like the Phoenix Saga and yeah. Arcade yeah. and Proteus and the Brood and you know uh, and all the other stuff that gets made into movies now. Exactly, yeah. It's like that is the era that you want to adapt the film and television. Yeah. Not the you know the early days when they're still trying to figure out the groove of the series. Yeah. I can imagine a show that that sort of starts with the original five for like the first opening pilot. Yeah. And then at the end we meet some uh, one of the new guys and then <laughs> they start the recruiting as, people as we go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like um that's like a great way to open a show. Or just like a scene I'd love to see in a movie is this part of a uh, Jean Grey's backstory. Yeah. Where it's when her powers first oh, yeah, manifested. Yeah. I heard yes. about this. <laughs> yeah, she had this friend named Annie Richardson. Uh she was like hit by a car. And Annie died in Jean's arms, and that was when her, her psychic powers kicked on, and, you know, she heard Annie's last thoughts in her head before she died. So it's like, that is messed up. Yeah. But, like, it would be such a gut punch to see, it, especially to open the show. And then it's, like, soon after that, uh, when the professor comes to her and uh, and, yeah. Emma, and Emma brings her to the school. Yeah. It would have been nice, like, this is the, this is one of the things why, reasons why X-Men The Last Stand was such a letdown, because, like, this is good stuff, but, like, and if the movie could have gotten into that, like really filmed that and showed that and made it a part of the movie, made it a part of Gene's character in that film, it would have been so great. But they just the movie's so overstuffed, they just don't have time for that. Or exactly. they, and, and they just don't have the instincts to, you know, find the good stories within this material and put those on the screen. So that's why, you know, we're, we're still waiting to see uh, that kind of thing. Like that was one reason that I was like, oh cool, they got uh, Sophie Turner to play uh, Gene in uh, X Men Apocalypse. But they're definitely not going to cover that. That scene, even though it would be so cool to see her play that yeah. scene. Yeah, like imagine if you know the when you know CGI young Patrick Stewart and Ian McKellen get out of the car to meet young Jean. I know that's that shit was you know retconned even before Days of Future Past. Yeah. But like if during that meeting they made some reference to oh yeah Jean hasn't been the same since uh, Annie died. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like yeah no shit you know <laughs> that's a, that's a horrible thing for a kid to go through even without psychic powers. Yeah. It's like. If you're gonna throw in things in the comics, like make it emotional stuff. Yeah. Not just oh this character and this yeah. superpower, but like and this name. But like yeah, you know, uh, Mr. X Men historian, what exactly was that revealed in the comics? Was um, it revealed I, I don't in... really remember. It, it might have even been in the old days. Okay. But I, I have a feeling it was something that Claremont threw in there around the time of like the Phoenix Saga when that makes you sense. Know, like, uh, it... she was sort of having her identity crisis because this is like you know that she kind of um, touched. Like, w- w- with Annie's death, Gene kind of uh, reached through the barrier of life and death just for a split second, and that yeah. kind of got her the attention of the Phoenix Entity. Yeah, I guess they the figured that out later, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The kind of forces that they're playing in that show, it's no wonder that some stuff gets really, really weird yeah. after a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the kind of thing that uh, the movies have trouble managing, but even if you had a show... Uh, and you see yeah. it's like on like on heroes especially where it's like okay you got people who can travel through time and bring back the dead and Why? control minds and control minds it's like wh- what do you even do with that <laughs> after a while you know, what problems can you possibly give these guys that they have that they have to struggle with solving yeah 
But uh, I remember on my comic book on my team, I was talking about um, a Days of Future Past, and I'm um, like I'm building up her epic history videos. Yeah. And I just mentioned that the movies we had, it's been a long time since we've seen uh, the X Men, like, I mean, get a call and get in the blackboard and yeah. go on a mission. Yeah. <laughs> just like really straightforward stuff that they would do every day. But I remember, yeah, like, movies, we, yeah. we, we got a little of that in, like, in first class, or you know, a version of that when the team was basically still in beta, yeah. but it like it felt so refreshing to yeah. just have them, you know, go out and you know find problems and you know exactly, find mutants yeah. to recruit and stuff exactly. like that. That was an amazing thing. Like in um, at the end of first class, it was this was the fifth X Men movie, but it was like the first time we really got a proper team versus team battle. Yeah, yeah, where you know we got the bad guys with their mutant powers, the good guys with their mutant powers, and they're all we very even... mismatched, but you get a really cool. So, like action scene out of it. We haven't even seen that in the Avengers movie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, but, like, we should have gotten that uh, in in the first movie, really. Yeah. But you know, I think it was because of uh, a relatively low budget. Yeah. That they couldn't really go to town with that sort of thing. Yeah. But we we should have gotten it in the third movie, but the action scenes were just so unimaginative. So unimaginative, and so sloppy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, it wasn't until uh, uh, first class. It's like that's what it should look like. Now it feels like an X Men universe yeah, yeah. in full swing with you know like Azazel teleporting around and Havoc blasting everywhere and Banshee and Angel flying around and stuff yeah, like yeah. that yeah all over the place uh huh yes yes like as much crap as I give the older X Men that was something that uh, Jack and Stan did, did really well in the early days when we finally got the Brotherhood in there and it was the X Men versus the Brotherhood on Asteroid M that's like a really cool um, a story for the time. Back in the Brotherhood was Gross Mangito and uh, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver and Mastermind and Toad, I think. Toad, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it was really cool and the collision of stuff going on. Yeah. <laughs> and a great space adventure, even. Yeah. It's like, okay, yeah, I'd love to see a movie that is like this. Yeah. You think we'll ever see Asteroid M in the movies? Oh, man, that'd be so good. But, uh, but uh, I don't think we're going to see it in this series. <laughs> yeah. So what we're getting at here is that the movies are still a very limited yeah. arena in which to really explore the X-Men universe. Yeah, especially since, you know, the movies, uh, not just in terms of scope, but they also, most of them only want to explore, like, uh, trying to improve uh, human mutant relations, that kind of thing. Never getting into their, you know, space battles or trips to the Savage Land or any of the more exotic comic book superhero stories that yeah, exactly. you can get into like that. I wonder how many, like, as they were trying to figure out which movie they were going to make next, like, how many stories got thrown out because, like, oh, this is this is a little too far from, you know, uh, what we want to focus on. Idea, or, yeah. or we can't fit Magneto into this uh, exactly, story. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, Magneto wasn't, um, like, he was in Days of Future Past, but only in the future part. Yeah, uh, in the original comics. Um, but yeah, he, yeah, why not have future old? Uh, he was an old man, Ian McKellen, and as young Michael Fassbender. That's you know, that's you know a great use of that universe for sure. That's one of the reasons why it's so interesting to imagine how this could be applied to a television. Uh, given that I think that the X Men movies in general cost less than the Spider-Man movies, or I think most of the Avengers movies. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think that uh, if you watch the first X movie, we said this before, that they could totally do that movie exactly as it is on television. Yeah, like, especially if you watch like Legends of Tomorrow and you see like, you know, eight yeah. people with superpowers and super gadgets, you know, just going at it. Yeah. Uh, see, all like out. that show. <laughs> like, uh, like, okay, I think, uh, I think there is no problem with special effect with superpower special effect budgets yeah. on television I anymore. I think we've overcome that. We're there now with that we do it on TV. Yeah. And uh, all you gotta look to is the existing X Men uh, animated series. Yeah. There have been uh, not counting the anime, there have been three over the years. It's surprising that there hasn't been another one, probably because of the whole, you know, Avengers, Marvel Cinematic yeah. Universe and uh, uh, have been trying to keep X Men uh, cartoon off the air, yeah, which just is kind yeah. of a drag. But we've gotten the original X Men animated series, and X Men Evolution, and Wolverine and the X Men. Yeah, and there's you know a fourth that we have to address, which was um, like in the late eighties, early nineties, they shot like in house Marvel shot uh, a yeah. pilot for an, for another X Men cartoon uh, that was released on video called Pride of the X Men, yeah, with a Y because it's you know uh, all about Kitty Pride joining right. the team. 
And, like, for a long time, like, back when you could go to your local toy store or record store or whatever, and there was a row of, you know, uh, TV episode tapes uh, of the older uh, superhero cartoons, that was the one, for a while, that was the only place where you could see the X-Men in animation, was yeah. Pride of the X-Men. Yeah, pretty much. And, like, uh, it was weird that... And it's funny to think that, oh, yeah, this could have been its own show. And while it seems, you know, very quaint and dated today, if that, that had gotten picked up, it probably would have been a lot better than a lot of the other shows, like the Fantastic Four shows and the Spider-Man shows that existed up yeah, to that sure. point. That, that, that would have been a real game changer. I mean, the X-Men uh, cartoon that we got was a real game changer. Yeah. So, you sure. know, yeah. no, and, and, no and, argument there. And then, of course, that, that pilot somehow spawned the X-Men arcade game, which had, you know, the same yeah. cast and the same... You know, costumes and so on. Yeah. So I guess there's, I guess there's that uh, legacy for that thing. Uh, but yeah, I was, I haven't even checked if you can find it on the internet anymore. We haven't, we, we used to watch it all the time, haven't watched it in a long time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a nice, you know, bit of uh, X Men history right there. Yeah. Taking it one at a time, watching the 90s cartoon now, it's still really cool in a lot of areas, but it does have a lot of uh, elements that you probably wouldn't see on a show nowadays like how most of the characters stay in their costumes yeah, all the time, all the time. Uh, there's like this famous like memeified image of uh Wolverine on the bed sort of like staring at this photograph and he's in his costume yeah he's in his, his mask on and everything he's in his yellow jumpsuit and everything yeah that's like dude at least take your boots off <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's why i love those uh when, when they did their when they did their version of the phoenix saga i love how it opens with you know, Xavier has a bad dream that's really, uh, you know, a, a vision for across space. And so he wakes up the entire team. So everybody is down in the war room in their, you know, robes and bunny slippers. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, why the hell did it's you really drag us out of bed for this? <laughs> like, that's how unusual it is. Yeah. And it's, uh, and so that was really nice. And then there's other scenes. Of, you always have that scene of the team, like, you know, uh, playing basketball on the court. And they're in, you know, some version of their street clothes. And so you can put a stopwatch. They're running guy. Whenever they're playing some recreation activity, it's only a matter of time before somebody, you know, brings out their superpowers and messes up the entire game. Yeah. So we did get, you know, a couple versions of that. Wolver you know, they play basketball and Wolverine skewers the ball on his claws, that kind yeah. of thing. I wonder if they might do that in the movie. Yeah. Yeah, that's we, yeah. Yeah, I think <laughs> that's another thing the movie still hasn't shown. Yeah. Um, anyway, actually, there was a scene in the very first one where they show the kids, you know, playing basketball and there's one kid who can teleport and is passing the ball to himself. Yeah. Like, yeah, in the earlier movies, a lot of the background games were just there for sight gags. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because like, the kid who can, like, uh, move uh, paper airplanes and stuff. The kid who can change channels by blinking. Yeah, and then a kid who can, like, you know, take notes without a pen. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, what a great superpower that is. <laughs> uh, but, like, for, uh, for a cartoon that was so experimental... Yeah, uh, it's it's so good. A lot of it holds up really well, and yeah. it, there not was, all of it. it. Not all of it. A lot of it is so very pacing kind of a is corny, wonky. Overwrought. Pacing is wonky, yeah, and um, um, the animation is a little clunky at points. Yeah, like but so it's, 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 it's still hugely influential, and it did introduce this whole generation to the X Men. Yeah, and uh, what about the animation? That's where you learn, and you know, as they've done further animated series over time you learn that okay if you make the the character sheets and the models too detailed they become harder to animate and that's why sometimes the, the animation is a little weird and then you see something like you compare like the 90s spider-man show to spectacular spider-man which has a much more stripped down simplified design but the animation is much more fluid yeah uh, which makes it look a lot better and you know it makes the action scenes a lot uh a lot more dynamic and more exciting and that kind of thing yeah. so it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of the the lessons we've learned over time. True. So yeah, the first X Men cartoon introduced a lot of people to the characters in the comics and that whole universe and everything. And yeah, still, so, even though it came about in the early '90s, which is now looked upon as sort of like a low point in not just X Men but in comics in general. Yeah, you had a lot of and it was a, lot, a lot, lot of bad stories and like eventually um, uh, <laughs> a lot of bad stories, a lot of bad business decisions. Then eventually we had you know Marvel filing for bankruptcy. Which yeah. led to them selling off their movie rights, which leads to all the you know, legal battles they're having with the MCU today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then and then of course the success of the X Men cartoon, which was still one of the longest running cartoons that any network has ever done. Yeah, led to a whole uh, chain of other 
uh, Marvel cartoons. We had, you know, Spider-Man the Animated Series, and then we had, you know, uh, Iron Man and Fantastic Four and Hulk, and then it kind of finished off with Silver Surfer, and then they did an Avengers cartoon, which I don't think counts. Yeah, it, it was definitely a... Uh, it dipped down, you know, like, you, you kind of watch uh, Marvel as they, you know, as they're, you know, building up, and then they it all kind of drops down. That's where we get, you know, finally the yeah. bankruptcy. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, and they definitely kind of like lost creative control, I guess, over a lot of their shows, and mm-hmm. they went to lesser minds. I guess so. For the give a shit, that that seems to be what happened. Yeah. Uh, but then, uh, the movie started to pick up. Yeah. Uh, with the uh, the first X movie, and then we got X Men Evolution. That's right. Now, yeah. I'm sure that uh, a lot of fans would not be too keen to see like a CW X Men show that like puts them all in high school. Makes it all very yeah. uh, teen oriented, yeah, small but like, Buffy you know, and Roswell. But that show exists. It's called X Men Evolution. Yeah, and furthermore, if they did an X Men show on the CW, it probably wouldn't even be you know a high school type show because the CW is becoming like the superhero yeah. network these yes. days. <laughs> yeah, they've actually, <laughs> which you know, which is so nice. Superhero shows without setting everything in high school. Yeah, um, and still kind of having that feel. They yeah. don't have to. Go through high school first yeah. to get everything going. But, like, you know, we, we, we've seen, like, uh, gone to conventions. They talk to the, the writers of X-Men Evolution talk about how, okay, like, we were required to, we were required to do certain things. We were required to do one of an X-Men show set in high school. They joked that they nicknamed it 9021X. <laughs> yeah. But, like, over time, trying to gradually, like, wrench the show over to where an X-Men show should be. So, like, as we, as we follow it from season one, which is just kind of okay, there's, there's a few good episodes in there. And as we they work up to season two and then three and then it lasts into season four. By season four, it really is just an X Men show. By yeah. then, in season four, they're like fighting apocalypse and you know uh, trying to save the world. And they have a ton of characters and a lot of good, um, a lot of good stuff there. Yeah, by yeah that but point. I think that it's uh, it's probably the, it's one of the best examples of like uh, building the X Men world from the ground up. Yeah, where you start with a small team and then we bring in a larger and larger cast as we go along. Um, Everybody joins the team gradually, and then like uh, the bad guys are also forming their team. Then eventually we get big uh, clash of um, good versus evil mm-hmm. there. Yeah, I kind of think I like how they uh, built up Magneto as a villain. Mm-hmm. That was sort of fun to see. Whereas on the first cartoon, we just see him right away. Yeah, Pretty and much. like he Magneto was really good on the show. The yeah. backstory was a little weird, but he was really good. The voice actor was really good. Yeah, all all the just you know. Uh, how they handled him on the show, like as an overarching uh, villain slash sometimes ally, was yeah. really good. Yeah. Even when I read, I, even when I read uh, the comics, I still picture the Magneto voice from the first cartoon. Yeah. One thing that Evolution did much better was the Sentinels. Yeah. They, they really <laughs> yeah. upped the Sentinels as far as the action is concerned. Like when you see the Sentinels stomping around yeah. on, on Night of the Sentinels in the cartoon, it's like. The Sentinels are a terrible idea. Yeah, so like, they're, oh, tearing, if... they're causing hundreds of millions of dollars of property damage to catch one mutant. Yeah, it's like I wonder if the way they did the Sentinels on, uh, it's like, I, like it's almost like I made a list. Like, you and I made a list of complaints for the Sentinels from the original cartoon. We sent it off to Marvel, and then they made the Sentinels on Evolution as a direct response to that. Yeah, that's so great. Well, and it's a shame that the Sentinels only appeared a couple of times on Evolution. Yeah, yeah. Once at the end of season two, I think, and then they brought him out again in at the end of season four to help him fight Apocalypse. Right. But they, with the, at the end of season two, they have this glorious yes. battle yeah. where they fight, and it's Day one reckoning. Sentinel, one Sentinel against three teams of mutants. Yeah. <laughs> and he's just you know, and like he's like half the height of the uh, Sentinels from the first cartoon, but he's like crawling with weapons and he's just wiping the floor with both teams, and it is a lot of fun. It yeah. is so great. It's like, what? Wow, this is the X Men show that I want to see. Yeah, <laughs> finally, and this is the Sentinel that I want to see. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, it was one of the things that a lot of people liked about the Days of Future Past movies. We finally got to see the Sentinels. We got to see a past version and the future version of the Sentinels. Uh, you know, do, you know, doing doing what they do. And, uh, yeah, and so, yeah, I feel like, um, a bunch of permitting, a lot of people would have expected to see the Sentinels in the first movie. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like the Danger Room. Yeah. And, um, some other things, but yeah, the, another thing they botched in the, in the, in the third one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, we, we actually want to see the Sentinels. 
We want giant robots. Look at how much money the Transformers movies always make, no matter how bad they get. Yeah. <laughs> what is wrong with you? So, yeah. Finally got Sentinels. It was where we kind of only got the past Sentinels and then the future Sentinels. Not really the present Sentinels. Yeah, but like, that's, well, like we don't yeah, really yeah. get the X-Men in the present day anymore. They yeah. kind of had to write those out so they could, you know, just do whatever confusing thing they're doing in the movies now. Yeah. So if they did like an, a straight up X Men show, I honestly wonder what the Sentinels would look like. Yeah. Um, I How can't do imagine you do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think in our first podcast we said that they would all they would be kind of like I'm with the Cybermen, but um, a bit bigger. Maybe, yeah, I guess. But uh, they would have to be. It would be weird to do them with practical effects. I feel like mm-hmm. even on the TV show, it would, it would look more like Power Rangers if they did it that way. Yeah, and I don't think that's what we need right now. I think even Power Rangers doesn't do it that way anymore. Yeah, yeah, they're you know, uh, uh, at least all these Zord transformations on Power Rangers are all CGI now. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I bet if they did a live action show, I bet they could get away with doing Sentinels by using CGI and motion capture. Yeah, I think they could handle it. The idea of like a hunter killer robots, uh, I think it might be a bit of a challenge to make them scary again. Yeah. Um, especially since for the first part they're not really killer robots. I feel like. well, the next one evolution maybe even because it was a Saturday morning cartoon. Yeah, they wanted them to you know capture and immobilize the X Men, which you know lets some great thrills too. Yeah. Um, so it would. Uh, no, I wouldn't immediately want to jump to um, setting up Daisy Future Paths where they're going to destroy everything if the yeah. X-Men don't stop them. Yeah. And it's funny to me that um, we had the uh, X-Men Days of Future Past movie and then we also had the Age of Ultron movie based on... And they're both based on robots that become sentient and try to take over the world and wipe out humanity. Those are both based on comics from like the 60s Back when that idea was new, yeah, and so they, <laughs> so both of those filmmaking teams had to struggle to figure out a way to make that not seem totally stale. When by now it's the you know premise of like um, one out of every three comic books and movies. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that that was X Men Evolution, uh, and then finally the uh, the cartoon we got after that was Wolverine the X-Men. Mm-hmm. And when I first heard about the show, I was like, do we really need another X-Men show, especially one that centers around Wolverine? Yeah, especially since like, all the movies that centered around Wolverine by that point. Yeah. Most of them still do, except First Class. Yeah. And the answer is yes. Yeah. It, it really <laughs> felt, although it is not in the same continuity as Evolution, it really felt like the grown-up version of Evolution. Yeah. I think like a lot of the same people worked on both shows. Yeah. Um, it did the designs were uh, more um, uh, detailed, I think. Everybody looked a little older and not as smooth and stuff. But uh, overall, the storytelling felt like... Uh, a lot of it felt like the best parts of Evolution and a lot more of it. And even though it was only on for one season, it felt like one season of the best X-Men cartoon we could ask for. Yeah, and... But not like the first season, more like the second or third or fourth season. Yeah. Just like taken out of uh, context. And yeah. Like, it's interesting it, watching a show where we're coming in the story in the middle. Yeah. Like, um, the, the X-Men have already been around for a few years. They're already, you know, uh, they've already had it, gone on a lot of adventures together. That's where the show, that's where the first episode starts. Yeah. And then this, you know, horrible thing happens. Basically, they think Xavier is dead. Yeah. And so they kind of uh, disperse for, uh, like, a year until Wolverine gets a vision from the future and says, dude, you have to bring the X-Men back together at all costs. Yeah. Because, you know, the so, future is in jeopardy. Yeah, kind of like uh, my Days of Future Past. Kind of like that, on. yeah. So, yeah. A lot of the same basic ideas going on there. Uh, but, yeah, it ended up being, you know, as faithful an adaptation as you can imagine. Which... Yeah, and also just, like, throwing, like, using almost as much stuff from the X-Men comics as possible, particularly at the end. I, I wonder if... In the final, was it a three-part finale? Yeah. Uh, in the three-part season finale, which turned out to be a series finale, they were concerned about, hey, we might get canceled. we got to do everything at once. So yeah. I don't know that they were concerned about that, given that uh, they'd already started production on season two by then. Yeah. Uh, before that, before they pulled the plug on that all of a sudden. Yeah, but like that, that uh, 
once the action gets going, introduced so much stuff right here, like uh, the Hellfire Club coming in all of a sudden. Yeah, and all of a sudden, even though they hadn't appeared, and you have the Phoenix go along with everything else they had going on. Yeah, so so there's that, uh, there's that, and with the Phoenix, there was Magneto and the Sentinels, and then there was you know Xavier fighting, uh, you know, with his team in the future, all at the same time. So yeah. we effectively have many you know big X Men. Uh, battles going on all at once. Yeah, uh, that's why I wonder if like we gotta you know compress this and get all the good stuff in there before the show's gone. Yeah, I wonder. Maybe not. Maybe they plan to do it that way all the time. Yeah, <laughs> but it was, but it was a lot of fun. But anyways, uh, it got like they had announced season two. It looked like they were going on season two, and then like all of a sudden it got canceled for reasons that were at the time unclear. I think um, it, it general... seems to have to do with uh, Marvel. Um, wanting to shut down the cartoons that they didn't have the move, they didn't have the film rights to. Yeah, but also like in a way, it was the same reason that Spectacular Spider-Man got canceled and Avengers vs. Mighty Heroes got canceled, which was in a way the MCU was swallowing everything up. Yeah, and everything basically became subservient to those movies in a way. Yeah, <laughs> in a general sense. Yeah, so it's like we got a lot of really good uh, Marvel superhero shows. That got canceled anyway because of weird behind the scenes stuff, yeah. and that was one of them. And That's weirdly, X Men didn't get replaced by a new X Men cartoon because, like we discussed, if Marvel can't control the X Men the movies, they're not going to promote uh, them anywhere else. Like even in the comics, their involvement has been um, pared down, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, bring it back around yeah, with it, you know, yeah, it's, it's like what is, what does Wolverine the X Men tell us about how to do? Uh, yeah. Uh, X Men in prime time. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, there's I think we've said all we can say about Hellfire and, and Legion at this point. Yeah, that uh, it's like, um, what other X Men shows could they do? I don't know. I wonder, you know, like uh, with the success of Deadpool, I know that they're making that Gambit movie, so maybe they'll consider doing more solo X Men movies. Yeah, which, which is what they wanted to do back with like um, X Men Origins Wolverine, but since that uh, was such a disaster. They folded uh, the Magneto movie into first class, which I was fine with. Yeah, and like those Ma- Magneto scenes in the early part of that movie really elevate the whole film. Yeah, and are some of the best stuff in there. Yeah. I wonder, like, how how far can they take Legion and Hellfire before they either run out of ideas or have to start throwing in more X Men um, yeah. uh, mythology elements into it? To, yeah, I'm gonna. To, uh, to spice things up. Yeah, if they happen at all, because those pilots might not get picked up. Yeah. We don't know. This, this might be the end of uh, the whole thing. Yeah. And it's back to the drawing board. Uh-huh. Uh, but, I don't know, what other X-Men TV show ideas have been kicked around? Like we said, there was like an X-Factor Investigations. Yeah. Which, you know, would be interesting, kind of like taking uh, one of the really best X-Men titles in the last decade, I'd say, from yeah. um, Peter Davis sort of continuing a lot of the work he did on the on his first X Factor run. Yeah. And then we're picking that up to have mutants, like team of mutants who kind of, you know, um, do private investigator. Yeah. Work, and, like and, Jessica and Jones. Yeah, and it's much more low key and very character driven yes. uh, book. And um, like, if you do make that show, you know, see if you can get Peter David to write yeah, for that he's, show. He's ready for television. Yeah. He knows what he's doing there. Yeah. He knows these characters. <laughs> yeah. He's, it'd be great. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what else, aside from just doing a straight-up X-Men show. Like, while I go up, it's like, okay, which A-list a title is going to get a TV show first, Batman, Superman, X-Men, or Spider-Man? And uh, I think that right now Superman would be at the bottom of the list because we've got Supergirl now, yeah. and that's doing quite well. Yeah. So I was like, okay, and, you know, yeah, for her. Superman's cool, but... You know, it's it's a good time to explore a different side of that, and uh, the Supergirl is actually covering a lot of uh, interesting ground there. Yeah. Um. Then we got uh, Batman. It's got Gotham. Gotham is insane and still yeah. on. We stopped watching Gotham at the end of season yeah. one. We don't I care. But yeah, I'm I'm still obsessed with like a Batman TV show. Yeah. In the meantime, we got Spider Man. Um. I'm I'm kind of pre- like all right, they're ready to introduce Spider Man into the MCU. And have a, another movie with uh, with this young actor Tom Holland, who's going to be in Civil War. Yay! Um, this one's going to be more uh, a part of that universe. 
Um, I'm still kind of crossing my fingers that they just do a TV show instead of another set of movies <laughs> because I'm so ready for it. And yeah. like we said, with the effects on Legends of Tomorrow and Supergirl and The Flash, yeah, the effects needed for a Spider-Man show are, are there. Right. Yeah, they're we ready. Got it. <laughs> They can do it now. There's a couple of hard stuff. They can push the envelope. They're so ready. I feel it. Yeah. It's like, uh, I feel like that would be at the top of the list. But then you got X-Men, who, you know, I would I would love to see, and this could apply to all of them, a TV show and movie series that, like, it all ties together. Like, we have, mm-hmm. um, we have um, the regular seasons, and then every summer or two, we get a movie that yeah. could either be a standalone thing or it could tie into the show. Yeah. Kind of like, a, like on the Doctor Who Christmas specials. Yeah. Huh. That'd be interesting. interesting. It'd be cool to do that with X-Men where, you know, there's a lot of um, a table setting and filler stuff going on on the, on the regular show and then the movies are like the big events that require a larger budget. Okay. Huh. Interesting. <sighs> yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Um, one of the things that always annoyed me about the 90s cartoon was yeah. the fixed roster. Oh, yeah. They had, like, the same was seven a... heroes for the whole show, and they had some of the guest characters like Colossus and Nightcrawler and a few others, but none of them joined the team. Yeah, and they uh, all left to do other things. Yeah, even on the other cartoons, like on X-Men Evolution, they had, you know, the roster was always growing as the yeah. show went on. And on Evolution, and on Wolverine the X-Men, it was a little different. You had, you had your main cast... But, uh, and then there were other supporting characters like Angel and others who, you know, uh, were weaved in and out of the show. Yeah. As it went on. But, like, it was only one season, so yeah. it's kind of hard to measure that kind of thing. But, yeah, um, people never joined the team on the original series. Yeah. It was just the same. The, the, they started with the same team they finished with. Yeah. One of the coolest things of reading X-Men um, through the years was how there were um, people um, coming in and go and um, I'll leave the team, like, all the time. You'd read uh, one story, and then a few years later, you'd read that story, and there'd be a whole different set of people on there. Yeah. Um, but it was still um, really thrilling to um, uh, to watch everybody evolve. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with the roster work, I'd say one of the closest comparisons I can make is on uh, Young Justice, where you have basically the core team, and then you have a few other tertiary characters floating in and out as needed. Yeah. And then, like, in the second season of that, they expanded the whole cast. Like, the the main cast from the first season were still featured prominently, but even they weren't on every episode. Yeah. Every episode. So, yeah. 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 And then um, X-Men Evolution is something similar. With in, in season two, they brought in basically the new mutants. Yeah. Just and really. added them to the team. It was like a dozen new um, uh, young um, uh, mutants. Uh um, brought in all at once. Yeah. Which is, I think, something that the comics also did a lot. Um, yeah. There weren't a lot of characters who were introduced individually. A lot of them come in... They, they come in as, groups. As part of a group, yeah. Like, yeah. you've got the Marauders, and then you've got um, the... Oh, shit. The Acolytes. The Acolytes, yeah. Yeah. And, 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 like, there would always be, like, every... It seems like every month there would always be a new team of evil mutants for yeah, them to yeah. fight. Like... Teams of evil mutants in the X-Men comics are a dime a dozen. There yeah. are so many. Yeah. And the Hellfire Club. That's yeah. another one. Yeah. Which I remember was kind of hellish when we were, like, collecting the action figures for them. Because, like, with the teams of bad guys, they would never make the whole team of bad guys yeah. in the action figures. They would only make one or two guys. Yeah. Ever. Yeah, and then well, you just have to you just have to go with it. Yeah. <laughs> or with... Um... <laughs> Uh, with X Force, we're going to cover this when we do our action figure videos. They did a lot of the X Force uh, characters, but not really the of the female characters. And you know, say what you will about that book in its early days and its formation and Rob Liefeld and whatever, it did have a sizable female uh, population in its ensemble right from the beginning. Yeah. Uh, and did they get any action figure love? No, they did not. Yeah. It's like, oh, we'll throw on Domino and we're done. Yeah, more and, Shadow Stars, more War Pass, and more and more cables. Yeah, because you know, as as, you, as as has been in the news lately, um, and even back then there was a belief that you know, oh, these you know boys that were actually marketing these toys to aren't gonna you know get uh, action figures of the girl characters, no matter how popular the characters are, um, and that still continues to this day, and that's why, and, and, and I like that people are speaking up against that, but it is yeah. depressing that it still goes on. Yeah. 
one of the things I think is cool is, and you get this in a lot of comics, but especially in X-Men, you have these like second or third string characters that are introduced over a long time. And then every so often they have to, you know, uh, rearrange the characters, rejigger the titles and such. So, so like with the, with the, with the second X Factor book with Peter David, and he's like, okay, I'm gonna bring in all these uh, B level characters and make them a team, and so so suddenly they are moved to the forefront and get a lot of character development that they didn't get before. Yeah, and so they all become inter- very interesting characters in their own right, uh, whereas before they were just on the fringes. So you get a lot of that, and so with that, like if you do, um, we do that kind of thing on TV. That's that's usually where spinoffs come in. Yeah, it's like, you know, is there anybody on the show we can spin off? Oh, yeah, lots. Yeah, that's another area in which a TV show tends to be a little stronger than the movies is that if you look at all the X-Men movies, they're basically about, like, four or five people, yeah. mainly. Um, other people are just, like, along for the ride. Even uh, main players like uh, Cyclops and Storm. Yeah. Uh, they don't get a ton of uh, development, even though they're major characters in the comics. Mm-hmm. Um, and then... Uh, we first started reading in the early 90s. Yeah. Uh, when, like, X-Force was first going on, and there was the new X-Men title uh, with the with them with the blue and gold teams going on. And it's interesting, uh, going back and reading the stuff that came before, uh, how much uh, of the narrative was devoted to characters that would soon be brushed aside. Yeah. Characters like, you know, Moonstone and uh, Skids and Rusty. Yeah, but, like, that happens a lot in comics. Like, if you read... Say, like, if read early Avengers, like, in their early days with the original six, they're fighting characters who nobody cares about, like the Space Phantom, <laughs> you know, uh, who is uh, a sort of shapeshifter, but it's like, who cares about the Space Phantom? Sometimes in those early books, you gotta, like, keep throwing ideas against the wall and see what sticks, and what sticks are the guys that you bring back, and those are the guys that end up in the movies and on the cartoons and so on. Exactly, yeah. That's kind of, you know, the best thing about doing an adaptation is you get to cut all the fat and sort of um, distill it down to its coolest elements. Mm-hmm. But I think at some point, especially with the X-Men, you do need to have that filler in there. You need to have some points where a yeah. can just sit around and talk about their problems before going out and blasting other evil mutants. Or just, you know, go out and play basketball. Exactly, yeah. For a while. Just, you know, let, just let, let the characters hang out and shoot the breeze. Yeah. You can't. You don't have time to do that in the movies where you have to do two and a half hours every couple of years. But you can do it on the show. Yeah. Well, I'd say that about uh, covers everything I'd say about the, yeah, the subject yeah. of X-Men on television. Yeah, they would do pretty good there. Yeah, yeah um... If you have any thoughts, uh, you can know, tweet us at the Kev Rose or Doug Rose. Yeah, uh, on Twitter. Z's. Yeah. And, uh, Twitter and Instagram. Yeah. yeah. And uh, our next podcast will most likely be about uh, this year's Oscar contenders. Yeah. And uh, we will see you next time.